missionaries reaching China during the late Middle Ages. And reportedly they told the emperor something like this. We alone teach pure and undefiled the doctrine of the first Christians. And to some extent, all Christian denominations make a similar way to themselves. Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy and Mormonism, especially of the wine. In addition, most denominations have within them church parties who believe that they alone, in that tradition, teach pure and undefiled early Christian doctrine. Uh, some Lutherans are that way, uh, Wisconsin Synod, Missouri Synod, some Baptists, some Pentecostals, most fundamentalists, and others hold such views. Tonight I want to look at one such group that was also strong in the Episcopal Church, that was strong in Hanover County, and that to some extent still exists. It called itself Episcopal Evangelical or Anglican Evangelical, and its policies about church worship and church life came to be called Virginia Church. This group of Episcopalians the saving incarnation of God in Christ, and the Bible as the sole and inerrant authority for Christians. It also emphasized the need for an adult conversion or recommitment to Christ, the importance of sermons over sacraments, the relative unimportance of church ornamentation and ecclesiastical garb, and it also emphasized the duty of all Christians to be missionaries for the faith. Early Methodism emerged from the same movement, but unlike Anglican Evangelicalism, it left the Church of England. You'll be familiar with some of the names of the early leaders of the movement. They included the poet William Cooper, spelled C-O-W-P-E-R, the ex-sea captain John Newton, author of Amazing Grace, which is actually an Anglican Evangelical hymn, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, and the writer and philanthropist Hannah Moore. That this movement is a different kind of Anglicanism is shown by some of his hymns, Amazing Grace, Rock of Ages, Just As I Am, hymns the average layperson today may attribute to the Southern Baptist. In the United States, the real evangelical surge in the Episcopal Church did not start until about 1811. In the of that year, a young Princeton graduate named William Mead was ordained 60 or so miles from here in Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg. His ordainer was a dying James Madison, president of William & Mary, and Episcopal Bishop of Virginia. It was the last ordination of Madison's career. And Mead then made it his life work until he died in 1862 to revive the Episcopal tradition in Virginia. 
Shortly after his ordination, he persuaded a, a priest named William H. Wilmer to become active in the Episcopal Church of Virginia and to leave his native Maryland. Wilmer was a gifted revivalist, and wherever he went, he caused church growth. Ultimately, Wilmer ended his career as rector of Bruton Parish in Williamsburg and as president of William and Mary. Today, anyone who goes forward to receive Holy Communion at Bruton Parish walks over the grave of William H. Wilmer. From the 18 teens on, Virginia churchmanship grew in the Episcopal Church. By the mid 1830s, it looked like the future of the Episcopal Church belonged to this party, not to the High Church, not to the emerging Anglo Catholics, not to the Broad Church, not to the Low Church, but to the Evangelicals, who were Low Church, but, but more. Episcopal Evangelicals became a force in many of the dioceses of the Episcopal Church. And much of the movement's leadership continued to come from Virginia, hence its name. Its prime school for training clergy nationwide was Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria. Virginia Theological Seminary, which still very much exists, started incidentally at William and Mary in the 18 teens, but it attracted only one student, and he had the misfortune of having the name Smith, so he's become quite anonymous in our history. <laughs> at that time for deism, coming from the colonial period. Tidewater, Virginia was also viewed as the center of malaria. And so the seminary soon moved from Williamsburg to Alexandria, where it quickly flourished. Bexley Hall at Kenyon College in Ohio was also established to train evangelical Episcopal clergy. Now, restorationist movements claim they know what original Christianity was like. That's what the Nestorian missionaries claim to the Chinese emperor. And restorationist movements not only claim they know what original Christianity is like, they also try to reproduce it in the present. And that's what Virginia churchmanship tried to do for the entire Episcopal Church, convince it to follow the patterns of original Christianity. And the Restorationist tenets of the early Virginia churchmen seem to have embraced at least those five principles on the handout you have. First principle, that the Bible, and only the Bible, is the norm and standard for Christian faith and practice. Second principle, that ecclesiastical discipline is a mark of the true church. Virginia churchmen held, that is, to a doctrine of what we call the church as virgin. Communicants of the Episcopal Church, they taught, should be as pure as an original sin permitted. And anyone who is unwilling to live up to the high demands of Christian discipleship should leave the church, otherwise he or she would be expelled. And therein lies an interesting story. In the first half of the 19th century in America, Episcopalians living in evangelical dioceses, heavily influenced by Virginia churchmanship, could be admonished or forbidden confirmation or forbidden the Lord's Supper or excommunicated or deposed, depending on the offense, the frequency in a diocese or parish, if they did any of the following things, any of the following things, gamble, play cards, duel, Swear, drink spiritus liquor, wine was okay. God <laughs> made wine. Natural, natural. Leave out juice and you'll get fermentation, but he didn't make distillers. <laughs> spiritus liquor, you did not drink. Get drunk, frequent taverns, attend a cockfight, attend the theater, attend a ball or dance, race horses. Breed horses for racing, deal too much in levity, <laughs> or do frivolous things on Sunday. Now, in other evangelical denominations at the time, of course, such an opposition to what was called worldly amusements, the amusements of the world, was then common in America. If a church member became involved in them, he or she would be paid a call by the elders of the church or the minister or both. 
ultimately evangelical denominations would expel such wayward members if they did not repent and mend their ways. <clears throat> the 21st century. It is surprising to read that the worldly Episcopal Church once had such prohibitions. <laughs> but this enforcement of ecclesiastical discipline should be viewed as an effort by the Episcopal Evangelicals to restore the supposed moral purity of the early Christian church. A third restorationist principle of the early Virginia churchmen, they believed they were restoring the faith and practice of the early Christian fathers and not simply that of the New Testament of the first century alone. Now, when you make the claim of restoring, quote, pure and undefiled, the doctrine of the first Christians, unquote, the problem always is, where do you draw the line? Do you do something in church or believe something that is not especially supported by the New Testament? Do you, for example, celebrate Christmas or Easter? Well, the New Testament doesn't, but Christians in the, starting in the second century do when they use the term uh, the Eucharist for the New Testament, for the uh, Lord's Supper, and the New Testament doesn't use that term. And finally, how do you select your clergy if you're restoring true Christianity? And what do you call your clergy? That is, Mr. or Ms. or Mother or Father or Reverend or Doctor or Pastor or Preacher. And if you choose that title, Reverend, do you stop there? Or do you go on to such intensifications as very reverent, right reverent, most reverent, or perhaps most appropriately rather reverent? <laughs> <laughs> we have a description of Christian worship dating from about the year 150, dating from about the year 150, that declares that the pastor of a Christian church is elected by the congregation and called the president of the brethren. That was the church in Rome. Virginia churchmen didn't know of that document, but they preferred the title Mr. to all of the others. To them, that title best summed up the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. So the question always is, where do you draw the historical line when you attempt to restore true Christianity? The Virginia churchmen were willing to draw that line further into the period of the church fathers of the first four centuries than any other evangelical group in America. They didn't idolize the early church fathers like St. Augustine. Like other Protestants, they believed that errors in doctrine and worship had infiltrated Christianity very, very early. They saw error in authority and sacraments and ministry and salvation and worship all had crept in. But the Virginia churchmen took the teachings of church fathers such as St. Augustine very seriously just as long as they found that teaching consistent with Scripture. A fourth principle. As Protestants did in general, the Virginia churchmen taught that the true Christian church had been so added to and so deformed over the centuries that only a great revolution could restore it. And they saw the English phase of the Protestant Reformation as truer to the original exact model of Christianity than any of the other <coughs> Reformations. But they also saw one phase of the English Reformation as truer than any of the others. And that was the Calvinist Reformation that briefly occurred in England in the 1540s and 1550s under the boy king Edward VI. In Europe, the Reformation of the 16th century was precipitated by the concerns of theologians. In England, the Reformation emerged from the concerns of monarchs. England's Henry VIII broke with the Pope in the 1530s. For the next century and a half, various English monarchs and their advisors tried to find where the Church of England belonged on the theological spectrum. And ever since the time of Elizabeth I to the 1500s, the Church of England has been a comprehensive church whose broad roof has sheltered various parties we call churchmanship parties. And from the 18th century on, Virginia churchmen were a churchmanship party in England. 
U.S. Today, most of you who are in this audience are probably, I guess, centrists, or what we would call Elizabeth I Episcopalians. Those who are higher church could be called Charles I or Henry VIII Episcopalians. And those who are lower and the, our Episcopal Evangelicals or Virginia churchmen would be called Edward VI Episcopalians. And that's because they were so Protestant. The Edwardian Reformation went but skin deep, the British historian has written, and he's correct. But his remark describes only England. In America, three centuries later, the Edwardian Reformation penetrated to the very soul of the clergy and laity who were Virginia churchmen. So it's not surprising that many Virginia churchmen were either professed Calvinists, like the New England Puritans, and like Edward VI and his advisors, or sympathetic to Calvinism. Calvinism carried with it, of course, a belief in predestination, and few Virginia churchmen went that far. But the one professor who taught at Virginia's Theological Seminary when it was in Williamsburg was actually a Calvinist predestinarian. <laughs> and it's clearly true that many of these early Virginia Episcopal clergy were closer to Puritan or Presbyterian clergy than to today's high church Episcopal clergy. Often they led services dressed in a black gown with white tabs. Often they had their portraits painted that way. And now a fifth Restorationist principle of the evangelical Virginia churchmen. They believed they had restored the original theology of Christianity. What was that original theology to them? It was summed up very concisely and accurately by what they called the evangelical summary. And it went like this quote, The fall of Adam, the consequence, consequent imp impotence of man, the sufficiency of the grace of God bestowed for the sole merit of Christ. End quote. And the Virginia churchmen stressed <coughs> the Reformation doctrine of justification by grace through faith, and they took the doctrine of original sin very, very seriously. As an example, shortly before his death, William Meade, by now the aged Bishop of Virginia and the head of the Confederate Episcopal Church could declare that in his view he had, quote, never performed one single act without some sin intermingling with it, end quote. That's the doctrine we might call total depravity. Hence, for me and for other Episcopal evangelicals, and a Christian is not saved by doing so-called good works, for they are all tainted even in a little tiny way with egotism or an opportunism or the like. It is a far, far better thing I do this day than I have ever done. <laughs> <laughs> and for almost three decades in the 19th century, the rector of fashionable Trinity Church in Boston, still there on Copley Square, addressed his congregation as, quote, vile earth and miserable sinners, worms and children of wrath. <laughs> and because the congregation actually agreed with his assessment of the human condition, they did not fire him. Today, such a cleric might not bear as well. And in Alabama, the Episcopal bishop's name became Richard Hooker Wilmer, son of William H. Wilmer, born in Williamsburg, trained at Virginia Seminary. Bishop Wilmer frequently declared that the following lines from the hymn Rock of Ages express the sum and substance of his religion. Quote, in my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. End quote. And in Ohio, which was the straw, this was the center of evangelicalism, the Episcopal Bishop said the words of an 1836 hymn written by Charlotte Elliott summed up what he had preached throughout his ministry. Quote, just as I am, thou wilt receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. End quote. 
Hence, this evangelical movement was simply a different kind of Episcopalianism than most Americans are accustomed to today. It was Protestant Episcopalianism, experiential Anglicanism, primitive CV. So let's conclude this evening by looking at some of the characteristics of Virginia churchmanship as it developed from the 18 teens on. And this is tempting coffee, excuse me for. <laughs> First characteristic quiet theological orthodoxy. Things may be changing, but Virginia churchmanship has in the past been somewhat conservative, doctrine, doctrinal. Few books have emerged from its parishes or pulpits that have been intended to shape the faith. The theological author John Shelby Spong was once an Episcopal clergyman in Richmond. What he did is a major shaking of Orthodox foundations in Christianity from Newark, New Jersey. Better place to do it. The second, <laughs> the second characteristic of Virginia churchmanship is a concern for good preaching. Virginia churchmanship believed that good preaching benefited Christianity more than ritualistic worship. They believed congregations got more out of substantial, serious, and earnest preaching than out of a service characterized by sacred gestures and ritual. In the 1920s, the professor of preaching at Virginia Seminary used to tell his students every year to follow this advice on sermons. Start low, rise higher, gain fire, wax warm, sit down strong. <laughs> <laughs> and now a third characteristic. Virginia churchmanship has displayed a concern that Christians obey a higher standard of behavior than worldliness or fashion. Obviously, standards vary, and obviously things change over the decades. But I've been in Virginia since the 60s, and I have never experienced an Episcopal tradition where there has been, has been more caution <coughs> among clergy and laity about participating in worldly amusement. <coughs> Not until after World War II, for example, did Episcopalians in Virginia begin to attend dances or movies during Lent. They kept a strict Sunday observance, no cards, no movies. The majority of persons attending debutante balls in Richmond were Episcopalian. If not, they were Presbyterian. And until the late 1940s, the dancing stopped on Saturday night at the stroke of 12. I have even heard in person Episcopal clergy in Virginia ask men to stop swearing in front of them. All this represents a significant break with the generally worldly outlook of Episcopalians who come from other a fourth characteristic, ecumenism, or cooperation with other Christians. Virginia churchmanship has been cooperative with precisely the same denominations that the Church of England once disdained to the point of persecution. Wherever Anglicans were the state church in colonial America, you know, they generally treated the Baptists and the Methodists and the Quakers and the Roman Catholics shabbily. But adherents of Virginia churchmanship have done it differently. They have been at the center of the negotiations for unity with Protestant denominations. It's little known today, but in the 1940s, the Episcopal Church and the Northern Presbyterians, the Northern Pre and Southern Presbyterians were then separate because of the carryover of the, the, the schism caused by slavery. And in seminary, we used to always say, in Christ there is no East or West, but there is a North and South. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, North and the Presbyterians and the Episcopal Church seriously discussed uniting in the 40s. For a time, the discussions were so successful that the Presbyterian General Assembly, their version of our General Convention, actually voted in favor of union. And union would have occurred if the Episcopalians had voted similar. Now, on the Episcopal side, at the center of all of these discussions, one found Virginia churchmen. But when the issue reached the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, the Anglo-Catholic Party, the highest and most medieval party in the Episcopal Church, abruptly terminated the discussion. So they just stayed with it. For the Northern Presbyterians, the termination left them feeling embarrassed and deceived by Christian brothers. And truth to tell, 
the Presbyterians had been deceived because Virginia churchmen, the most Reformation-oriented group in the Episcopal Church, had handled the negotiations. What the Presbyterians still had to learn was that the Episcopal Church had other parties in it, and some of them were no fans of the Protestant Reformation. The fifth characteristic is that churches adhering to Virginia churchmanship have taken a low church approach to church architecture and worship. They haven't forgotten that Christian churches were originally simple houses. And Virginia churchmanship has been cautious about ornamentation in its churches. Through the 1950s, some Episcopal churches in Virginia still had no crosses in their interiors. Why no crosses until that late date? simply because Christian churches did not have crosses in their interiors historically until at least the 800s, or over seven centuries after the crucifixion. And by the Middle Ages, these crosses had developed into crucifixes. Worshippers would bow or kneel in front of them. They might make them a center of worship. And the word would go around the parish if the eyes of Jesus on the crucifix moved or if the eyes shed apparent tears. So to many Protestants, or right or wrong, crosses have become idols. And so well into the 20th century, the Virginia churchmen, and paralleled by some other Protestant groups, tended to oppose placing crosses in churches. Out exteriors would, would be okay, although that was a battle too, but that was accepted a lot earlier than you say, not going to make one of the steeple into a center of worship. Uh, Broom Parish, for example, did not have a cross on its communion table until 1940. As for worship, the approach to the sacraments in Virginia Episcopalianism has been subdued. The preached word has been primary. Until recently, mass vestments have been rare. Liturgical gestures have been few. Until the, about the 1970s, many Episcopal clergy were spoken of as ministers or presbyters instead of priests, although you get presbyteros, presbyter, prester, prest, priest, it becomes the same word, elder, shifting to hierarchical intercessor, but, uh, and that's the term we generally use today, priest. And in services of worship, processional crosses, like ch chancel crosses, were late arrivals. Candlesticks were not put on the altar in the chapel at Virginia Seminary until after World War II. I don't know how it is in Hanover County, but even today one can attend an Episcopal service in Virginia and see only one or two genuflections or vows or uses of the sign of the cross among worshipers. A sixth characteristic is that Virginia churchmanship has encouraged the leadership of laymen. But until the 1960s, this lay leadership did not include women. And so let's talk for a minute about what might be called Virginia church womanship. The picture that emerges from <coughs> printed sources and from interviews I've conducted with elderly Episcopalians, which I am now one, uh, <laughs> contains no surprise. <coughs> Until the 1960s, Episcopal church women in Virginia were not supposed to do any of the following. Preach, administer the chalice, lay read, announce, I don't know how true that is, but I've actually been told, no, the women did not make announcements in our church, oh no. Usher, pass the collection plate, serve on vestries, serve as delegates, go to church without wearing a hat, or work on the honor guild without wearing a head covering. Well then, what, if anything, could Episcopal church women do in church besides worship? Well, until the 1960s, they could worship. They could teach Sunday school, direct or sing in the choir, cook and serve church suppers, <laughs> sew, bake, and knit for church bazaars, and of course, clean up. <laughs> and above all, Episcopal women could work for their church through the many women's charitable auxiliaries, which raised a lot of money. <coughs> Hence, as in other denominations, women traditionally played a distinctly subordinate role in Episcopal churches. Yet after the social and sexual revolution of the 1960s, the three uh, uh, Virginia dioceses were among the first 
among the first in the Episcopal Church to ordain women. There was something in Virginia churchmanship, probably its emphasis on the priesthood of all believers, that allowed it to quickly endorse women lay leaders and clergy. And now, the seventh and final characteristic, let's look at how Virginia churchmanship has viewed the office of bishop. And for an example, let's look at the three Episcopal dioceses right here in Virginia. In Virginia, Episcopalians have taken a definitely ambiguous view of the office of bishop. To be sure, its three dioceses are headed by bishops. <coughs> the diocese have shown every sign that they could, could exist without bishops. In some ways, Virginia Episcopal dioceses haven't differed that much from their colonial predecessors. Colonial Virginia Anglicans, after all, lived in Virginia, but had their bishop 3,700 miles away in England. Now, in Roman Catholicism, bishops are essential. And Roman Catholic bishops have <coughs> cathedrals. As early as the 1840s, Richmond had a Catholic cathedral. Yet none of the three Episcopal dioceses in Virginia has ever, ever had a cathedral. And every effort at establishing one is quickly dwindled. And so it's not surprising that the Episcopal bishops of Virginia over the years have minimized ecclesiastical trappings. The liturgical dress of a bishop since the Middle Ages has been a cult and mitre, items adopted by the church from strictly pagan usage. These articles of clothing dropped out of the Church of England after the Reformation, and they didn't return until the late 19th century. And they were very controversial when they did. Yet no bishop of Virginia until the 1950s wore either a coat or a mitre. And until recent years, they have tended to wear them only when visiting one of the relatively few Anglo-Catholic churches in Virginia. Back in the 1990s, when I was interviewing a 90-year-old Episcopal woman from Newport News, and I happened to mention that a bishop in Virginia occasionally now wore mitres, she answered in astonishment, oh my goodness, they do? I've never seen one yet. <laughs> and some instructive anecdotes are preserved about the 20th century bishops of Virginia. In the 1940s, presiding Bishop Henry St. George Tucker, a widely venerated Virginia churchman, was invited to a solemn mass in the Anglo-Catholic Cathedral in Milwaukee. At the mass, he was the only bishop not dressed in a coat and mitre. And when the recitation of the Nicene Creed reached the words, and was incarnate of the Virgin Mary. All the Episcopal bishops standing around Tucker in the pews fell to their knees in keeping with the Catholic custom of the time. A reliable observer reported that Tucker looked around the world wondering where everyone had gone. <laughs> Another illustrative anecdote. The Bishop of Virginia from 1944 to 1960 was a William & Mary graduate and country parson named Frederick Gooden. He liked fishing. He would not fish on Sundays, but he would cut bait. <laughs> he would not tune in to a baseball game on a Sunday, but he did eavesdrop on any radio at a picnic or something that had a game going. <laughs> and only on Sundays did Bishop Goodwin wear a clerical collar. Now, I've seen clerical collars here. I like them. They're good things. You know where they came from. From churches, they're called the Roman collar. It's really the angry collar. But the Jesuits adopted them and popularized them. I mean, that's what they think. Uh, the Church of England, some Church of England clergy were having trouble getting in the hospitals and so on. And they thought identifying Mark of some kind would help. So they just turned their shirts, shirts around. And initially, that sort of was just the back of the shirt. And then But it's good. It does, of course, change the parameters of the priesthood of all believers. But I've always always uh, liked them myself. In any case, uh, uh, only on Sundays did Bishop Goodwin wear a clerical collar. On other days, he usually went about his functions dressed in a black suit, white shirt, and dark tie. Some of the higher church seminarians in Alexandria used to talk behind his back and say that Virginia didn't have a bishop, rather than have a chauffeur. Yeah. <laughs> and then there were Episcopal rings. As the 20th century went on, Episcopal bishops increasingly 
began to wear rings bearing diocesan crests. They would use them to seal documents in wax. The world was, was on fire, but they had this uh, in, in reserve. At his consecration, someone gave Bishop Goodwin a ring and a jeweled pectoral cross, but that was not his style. He locked them in the safe in the diocesan headquarters in Richmond, which is, you know, is a house, uh, and simply didn't wear them. When a visiting Episcopalian once knelt to kiss his ring, Goodwin later said, huh, all that layperson got was an arthritic nipple. <laughs> As for Goodwin's predecessor, Bishop Tucker, he did not own an Episcopal ring, of course, but in meetings of the House of Bishops, it was necessary to place a seal on many official documents. And so he got in the habit of carrying a coin that wore the words, in God we trust. And when the time came for the bishops to add their seals to a document, Tucker would press his coin into the wax. Now there are a lot of similar anecdotes about Virginia churchmanship out there, and some I suspect, like that last one, are exaggerated. But even these stories, that have been passed out inaccurately illustrate the effort of Virginia churchmen to express Christianity not in pomp, but rather in simplicity. And that was also the goal of the Protestant Reformation. Well, so much for the lowest of the low, the Virginia churchmen. Today, the movement seems to be towards low church interpretations of Christianity and even towards low church popes. The era of monarchs and monarchical bishops, and kissing rings, and clerical casts, and all male clergy, and infallible churches, and sacred gestures, and pomp seems to be declining. From the 1920s on, a movement called the liturgical movement has called for churches to return to the beliefs and worship Christianity held before it became the official state religion of the Roman Empire. And this movement has emphasized that the pagan religions of the ancient Mediterranean world increasingly influenced Christianity and its habits of belief and worship. And the liturgical movement has also advocated building plainer <coughs> churches and placing tables rather than slab altars and chancels and elevating the importance of preaching and decreasing the amount of ecclesiastical millinery and giving, giving laity a larger role in the worship and affairs of a church. 200 years ago, Virginia Episcopalians first began to emphasize many of those same views. 500 years after the birth of the Reformation, it might be good if we Episcopalians gave Virginia church another try. Thank you. Observation should have been included. I, I'm asking, I'm not an Episcopalian, so I, I'm asking in terms of what, what was it, what were some of those characteristics of the Virginia churchmanship during those years? Am I not, I'm not hearing it entirely well. That's the problem. Oh, sorry. Well, what kind of outreach did they do in terms of helping the community and that kind of thing? Was that yeah. part of yeah, thank you. Uh, not knocking on the door, you know. Uh, not. Uh, I think there was. I, I'm really. Uh, I think I will flounder if I try to uh, do that. I w I've never been approached by a, an Episcopal pastor in my home, you know, to pay a call. I have been by Baptist, for example. Uh, there was a, there was an outreach into South America. I know missionary money for Episcopal parishes down there. Uh, but uh, the Episcopal Church
church remained small, you know, it's still a small church, smaller than it was. Uh, <coughs> well, say, I'm sorry, next year. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe someone so can answer social, that. Social uh, work kind of things, uh, things for the social good or the community. Yeah, nothing like that. I don't think I'm confident to, okay. to say that. I've never looked at it from that angle. so fond of the Reformation or something to that effect? Party, church parties, not so fond of the Reformation. Uh, the Episcopal Church had several. One was called Anglo-Catholic, one was called High Church, which was a little bit less than Anglo-Catholic. Now all the others kind of were Reformation in a way, but not, well, they simply existed because this is a scale the Reformation. Some people accept it wholeheartedly. Others uh, would like to leave. Well, I have a friend who doesn't want to hear that the Episcopal Church is at all Protestant. It's not as purified Catholic Church. <laughs> I've gotten him to say that as a laugh, but he's, he's quite, quite clear on that. Many people who held those views have left the Episcopal Church in the last 10 or 20 years, 30 years. But uh, there's still around, and shoot, you find that kind of thing in every denomination. Every denomination has a scale of church parties within it, and really the people at the extremes probably belong in the next denomination <laughs> down the line, you know? They're, they're very, very low church Episcopalians and maybe ought to be Presbyterians. They're very, very uh, high church Episcopalians and maybe ought to be Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholics. So, so they, I thought you said statues in a church. And, if anyone had asked me about statues crying, yes, I grew up with statues crying quite a bit, and there would be quite a bit of publicity of that. Oh, incidentally, which reminds me, one time I was at a line in New York City at a theological seminary, and the Eastern Orthodox Seminary was eating with the Protestants that, that particular year because of the housing situation, and there was a Call it not a mosaic, a wall, icon. an icon that was crying in Queens, New York, and they were talking about it. And although they, they were kind of standoff with us, but they were kind of talking about it. And finally, I asked one, one Eastern Orthodox who had been a Methodist before he converted, why he thought the statue was crying. He said, because we are cooperating with Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> missionary work, expressions of the Episcopal Church, and I think it's, as you would know, between 1850 and 1950, missionaries from, from Virginia went to China, Japan, East Africa, I and South we, America. We established, in fact, Virginia Episcopalians established universities in Japan, and they're still there, and right so on, in, in yeah. China, which I don't think they're still there. Yeah. yeah, that's right, I missed that entirely. And I think I will add that. I thank you, Madam, for that question, too. I'll Questions, yes, sir. Uh, I'm a Lutheran pastor, and what struck me is it sounds so much this church and ship movement sounds so much like tied to the, the Scandinavian, Northern German areas. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, maybe in the learning period, but uh, was there any kind of interaction? I know, I know through the Moravians, Wesley was affected. The Moravians were affected by Lutherans in Germany, but um, it, was it more of a parallel development, or was there some interaction, maybe in the early Reformation period, that started? Why they are so similar. Yeah, you know, very, very similar. Very similar. Oh. Well, first of all, when you use the word pious, you know, for Scandinavian evangelicals, right. that's what they, that pious movement is a European term for what we call the evangelical movement. So if there are, it looks like there are similarities, there, there are, you know. And the same kind of winds of doctrine, you know, uh, 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 blew into both camps, and they also knew each other, you know, or, or knew somebody who knew somebody, and hence there was a great influence of the, of the two. Uh, the interesting thing about the
Scandinavian Lutherans, we have Lutheran pastors here who know much more than I'm going to say, but uh, the groups of them who came over from churches that had bishops and would not establish their American versions with bishops, you know, and it's only been recently that, that we've watched bishops being added again to the, yeah, bishops were civil officials, of course, and they had some, some power. Thank you for that question. say thank you then and uh, hope to see you again. Uh, I've got um, a flyer for the next uh, speaker in this series. He's uh, David Zoll. He's the founder and director of Mockingbird Ministries and he will be at uh, St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Hanover, right across the street from Hanover Courthouse on Thursday, March 30th at uh, 7 p.m. So um, should I just pass this around? You think? All right, I'll do that. Oh, okay. I tried to do it real quick. So, sorry. That's March. If you try and come on February 30th, I'll, I'll be amazed if you make it. 